Thank you, David. Good afternoon. My name is Allison Tachi. I'm an MAS board member and also the president of City Parks Foundation in New York. Um, our next speaker is here to give us perspective on preservation and sustainability. His name is Cade Benfeld. Field. Cade is director of sustainable communities at NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council in Washington, D.C. He leads NRDC's activities pursuing solutions to environmental challenges in America's metro regions, the cities and neighborhoods. Cade also co-founded LEAD for Neighborhood Development, a national process for defining and certifying smart green land development under the auspices of the U.S. Green Building Council. He's also a founder and board member of Smart Growth America. Cade was recently voted one of the world's top urban thinkers in, in a comprehensive online poll, and he has also been named one of the nation's leading voices for sustainability by the Partnership for Sustainable Communities. Please join me in welcoming Cade Benfield. Good afternoon, everybody. I uh, was impressed by uh, David's presentation and uh, how well he did at talking about uh, the importance of uh, buildings, older buildings, and sustainability. I want to start with a phrase that David used, uh, is the greenest building the one that's already built? The phrase is generally attributed to Carl Elefante. And for a lot of reasons uh, that David mentioned, uh, it is in fact often true. And here we're looking at two buildings that are already built that I think are very green, uh, the one on the left and the one on the right. Uh, they're both made from locally sourced materials. They both require very little in the way of building conditioning from the electrical power grid. And they both are extremely well suited to their context. However, if a building is not taken care of, or if the context around that building is not taken care of, then that building is not going to be very green performing at all. And my submission to you is that we need to think about more than the building when we're thinking about building performance. One of the reasons is because of our pattern of uh, carbon emissions. Uh, here you see the national numbers for carbon emissions. Uh, transportation is the largest of those four categories. It's also by far the fastest growing. In building energy, we're actually doing pretty well in terms of uh, growth in carbon emissions. Transportation, we're not doing so well at all. And in fact, when we're talking about building in energy, we're also talking about the energy and carbon emissions that are generated by the transportation patterns associated with that building. This research shows that for an average office building uh, in the U.S., that we actually use, the laser pointer doesn't work there, but that we actually use more uh, energy and generate more CO2 getting to and from the building uh, than the building itself uh, uses. Both of those parameters, the internal building energy and the transportation energy affected by the uh, building are highly variable according to the characteristics of the building. So I want to talk about this in terms of two scales that I think matter particularly uh, to these issues. Uh, the first is the metropolitan region and our patterns of investment. It's one of the great tragedies of American cities that's starting in the late 1960s or so and continuing well into the 1990s. We basically took all our economic activity and investment and pushed it to the fringe of our metropolitan areas and we abandoned places that were left behind. Uh, these are both sites in New York. If you were to add up 
all of the vacant and abandoned land, square footage in New York City. And this is just the land that is uh, uh, zoned for residential. You come up with 17 square miles, which is an astounding number, and in fact is an area the size of Hartree. The geography of this investment is not fairly distributed, and I want to make the point even with respect to Detroit. Detroit has become sort of the poster child for what's now called a shrinking city. And the general meme on Detroit goes that because of the decline of the Rust Belt economy, that Detroit is in irreparable decline and its population has gone way, way down along with its economic activity. But if you look at the actual statistics, what's happened is that some parts of Detroit have declined and other parts of Detroit have actually grown and prospered. The region as a whole has been very stable. So this creates regional problems for the environment. Uh, I suppose the most obvious one is that the investment we're sending uh, to the fringe uh, takes place in the form of suburban sprawl and eats up uh, a lot of landscape uh, to the tune of uh, three acres per minute. But perhaps a bit more subtle is to get back to those transportation emissions. Uh, what you're looking at here is a uh, map of the tri-state area around New York. And what we're seeing is that with regard to transportation emissions per household, the areas in light yellow emit far less carbon than the areas in orange and red per household. So the worst thing that we can do for our environment is to disinvest the areas that have the characteristics of producing low carbon emissions per household. So my first takeaway for you today would be that if we care about green preservation, we need to care about the distribution of investment and the way that our metropolitan regions are growing, and we need to advocate for revitalization. I'd like to move now to the neighborhood scale. And my posit will be that neighborhoods, in order to have green performance, must be strong. And here we're looking at two neighborhoods that are both older neighborhoods. Uh, the one on the left is thriving and doing very well. Uh, the one on the right, not so much. When we evaluate whether a neighborhood is performing well in terms of environmental indicators, we can look at a number of factors. And these are just some, but these are some important ones. Particularly for transportation emissions, the most important is where that neighborhood is located in the metropolitan region. And that gets back to that carbon distribution map that we were looking at a couple of slides ago. Uh, the closer you are to the center of the region uh, or to the center of a uh, well-established suburb, then the lower the driving rates will be, the lower the, the carbon emissions. Historic properties tend to do quite well on that scale because they're located in the older parts uh, where the regions then grew up uh, around them. A second uh, characteristic, which is uh, not so well uh, understood, is that street connectivity turns out to be an extremely important factor. And what do I mean by street connectivity? I mean that intersections are good, small blocks are good, walking routes are shorter when that is the case. If we have dead ends, barriers, cul-de-sacs, not so good. That turns out to be the second most important factor in determining how much driving takes place in a neighborhood, and the most important factor in determining how much walking takes place in that neighborhood. We need density. We need critical mass. Uh, we don't necessarily need high density, but we need a threshold of density. Um, and we need places to go. And a number of speakers in the earlier session uh, today talked about uh, mixed use. It's very important. There's research showing that residents of good mixed-use neighborhoods weigh five to 10 pounds less than residents of sprawl when you control for other factors. The reason is because they walk more. We also need 
ways to get around, good public transit, good walkability, bicycle infrastructures, shorter driving distances, and we need green infrastructure, which David also talked about uh, in the uh, previous uh, presentation. What I like about green infrastructure is that it brings nature into a neighborhood at the same time that it filters the stormwater before it becomes polluted runoff. So, my second takeaway for you is that green preservation means strengthening the neighborhood around that which you want to preserve. I'm going to run very quickly through uh, some examples of neighborhoods that are revitalizing sensitively to uh, preservation. These are all from the Lead for Neighborhood Development program. I assume most of you are familiar with the LEED rating system for green buildings. LEED ND takes that to the scale of multiple building developments at the neighborhood scale. And we're not looking only at the technology and performance of those buildings, but we're looking at those other neighborhood factors uh, that I just discussed. Uh, the first one that I would like to talk about is Melrose Commons. It's here in the South Bronx. Uh, I hope some of you know it. It's a wonderful project. You can see how badly disinvested the area was. You see the vision for the area and what it will become. And you see some of the early uh, manifestations as the, the uh, neighborhood is being revitalized. In about an 80-acre area, there will be 2,000 mixed-income uh, green homes, uh, very high degrees of walkability and transit. They are recreating the street grid. Remember, the street grid is very important. Uh, lots of good green infrastructure and park space, on-site energy regeneration. And what is especially inspiring about the Melrose Commons story is that the neighborhood is planning their own destiny. A group called Nos Quedamos, which translates We Stay, protested an early redevelopment plan for the neighborhood and eventually evolved into the community development corporation that is planning and leading that redevelopment. Not one person will be involuntarily displaced as Melrose Commons uh, moves to maturity. Uh, the second neighborhood, very different kind of neighborhood, this is in Oakland. Uh, the Miraflores site, uh, which earned a gold certification under Lead ND, you see it there in the lower left outlined in blue. Uh, the uh, orange line is uh, the BART rapid transit system. The green line is a recreational trail, so it's very well situated for transportation. It was a commercial flower nursery. And if you look at that uh, satellite image, you can just see how jammed in the greenhouses were uh, to that site, all of which used pesticides and herbicides contaminating the soil as well as the deteriorating property of the greenhouses themselves. But if you look on the right side of those images, there were also historic structures on the Miraflores site. So the plan looks like this. It's a 14-acre site. We're going to have 330 mixed-income homes, including some dedicated to affordable senior housing, uh, lots of green infrastructure, renewable energy. And if you look on the right image there, inside that red parallelogram, are the historic structures that are going to be preserved at the heart of the neighborhood. The most interesting thing about Miraflores is that because it was next to the freeway, it was next to a source of pollution. The designers responded to that by creating a green buffer in between the freeway and the homes. No home is closer than 300 feet to the freeway. The senior uh, housing is at the farthest distance uh, from the freeway. And in that green buffer, they were able to bring a number of neighborhood amenities. Uh, the last of my examples is a very different kind of example. This is in Milwaukee. This is called the Brewery, earned platinum certification under our program. It's within walking distance of downtown. It's the Old Paps Brewery. And as you can see, it had deteriorated into a really ugly brownfield mess. Uh, but it's being brought back. 20 acres, 300 mixed income homes again. There's affordability, uh, over a million square feet of commercial and civic space. And what is particularly significant for preservationists is that 26 landmark structures 
are going to be reused for uh, the brewery. I mean, if that's not the most ambitious historic preservation uh, project in the country, it's got to be one of the most. I would invite you, if you're interested in Lead ND, to go to uh, NRDC's website at nrdc.org slash smartgrowth, where you can download our citizen's guide, where we tried to actually translate lead standards into plain English. And uh, I think we did a fairly decent job of that. My communications people are always happy when I plug my blog. I write about these issues every day. I'll probably be writing about you guys uh, sometime in the next few days, and I would invite you to take a look at that as well. For my closing slide, I want to talk about indicators for whether a neighborhood is performing well and performing green or not. When we're talking about a natural ecosystem, we look to natural species and natural features. You know, if it's a river, you might look at the health of the fish to determine whether the, the river is doing well. But for an urban ecosystem, we need to look at the people. And if we have children walking to school, if we have elders that are comfortable chatting on the sidewalk, chances are we have a well-performing, uh, strong, and green urban ecosystem. That's it for me, and I look forward to the rest of the program. Thank you.